I was saying on the podcast the other day that I um, God, who God, they all they often blur into one. Jamie, who was it? I understand. I, who was that I spoke to the other day? I was talking about. I was saying that when I um, I I interviewed a wrestling journalist once. I, I'm always very sort of clear on like I'm recording now, so you know, I mean, it's just p polite, so yeah. someone doesn't tell me like their pin code or whatever, you know, when. Um, when they're unaware, and but there was there was a wrestling journalist I interviewed once who got really paranoid about the fact that um, he thought he was being recorded when he when he wasn't, and since then it's sort of I've doubled down on trying to make it clear that when the tape's rolling. Yeah, I bet. Thanks. Fortunately, I'm not a giant psychopath, but you know, I don't. I mean, I don't know what. I mean, it was. A, I mean, if, if memory serves me correctly, it was a very interesting interview that I had with the wrestling journalist. But I'm not I sure bet. that. I'm not sure there was anything that he had to say that was uh, that was that confidential. You know. Yeah, juicy enough. You, well, you never know. There's a lot. There's a lot there in wrestling. I don't know how much you know about wrestling, but there's a lot of juice there. I bet. Yeah. No, not very much. Although I am a, a keen fan of WWF for sure. Right, right. Um, yeah, no, like I say, thanks for uh, speaking to me a bit later. I just uh, had um, a bang on a bit all the time, but I have OCD and I had like a proper, just out of nowhere, just like a, a little kind of cycle of loops and ruminations. And um, I've been quite nervous about this interview, I think, actually. Um, really? Why were old chums, Jimmy? Well, kind of. Like when I was oh, at Kerrang. No. Well, no, 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 no. I don't mean that at all. I mean when I was at Kerrang. I mean you were like beloved in that office. You know, oh, like what you there were like you know a bunch of members of staff who just they were always like fighting your corner. And I think because of my kind of route to that magazine, like I was a teenage Kerrang reader, but I was like I was quite indie as well, and um. They held Ruman in such reverence yeah. that I that, that Ruman didn't really mean that 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 same thing to me. You know, I was off kind of listening to all the things at the time, and I think I probably maybe slightly kind of took it for granted slightly. You know, they're yeah. all they're all. You know what it's like when um, you know when people are constantly telling you that you like something, it's amazing, it's the best thing ever, and you're a bit like, yeah, I'll work that out on my own time if that's all right. James, you've put your finger precisely. Is this is this the podcast? Because this is good stuff. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm rolling. You've put your finger precisely on Ruben's problem, okay. and, and I think any of the areas that Ruben didn't get into say things like perhaps Reading and Leeds, which who never let us play. And you think, how come? I think a lot of it was because the people that do like Ruben really fucking like them. <laughs> and I know exactly what it's like. Everyone does when your mate has got someone they love and they keep prodding you and saying, oh, this is brilliant. You'll love it. And after a while, you you might even get a bit annoyed with that. Yeah. And so you might, at the very least, you'll put it to the back of your mind. And if you're not careful, you might end up saying, well, actually, you know, I don't give a shit about them. And I think that was some of Ruben's problem was that the acolytes, so to speak, were so <laughs> fervent. Yeah. Sort of a lot of the time they, they put other people off, which is. Um, I mean, it, it, it's weird. I mean, like, I've been guilty of it myself. Like, I'm sure, like any music magazine I've ever worked at, I'm sure there are bands that, you know, if they come on the. Well, to be honest, most of the bands I like would probably not come on the radio. But if they, yeah. if they came onto someone's radio, I think they would be like, oh, God, Jesus Christ, I thought we'd. I thought we'd escaped ever having to listen to them again. You know, it reminds yeah. me of that. It reminds me of that guy. But um, so you'd think that we would have worked out now that the best way to kind of, I don't know, instill something that we like in someone else's passions is to have a bit more of a softly, softly approach. But um, but I, I just think as well, you just you were kind of like always there, really. And, I, and the reason I was saying I'm a bit nervous was because probably the last couple of weeks, really, I I've kind of just gone right in on your solo work and. Um, it turns out that probably, yeah, probably you're the, my favourite thing I've heard all year. <laughs> <laughs> so better late, better late than never. That's great. But you know what, James? That's what I sort of liked about uh, and still like about our relationship. When you were at Kerrang! And, and I got a lot of coverage. And I I was sort of aware. I knew that you weren't one of my like biggest fans. But, you know, I was still getting in the mag and we were still chums at the shows and we would still speak. And I just thought that was great to be able to have a professional relationship with someone who wasn't necessarily um, one of your fans. But now you've wrecked it all. Now you like the music. We've got nothing. Jimbo. No, exactly. No, exactly. <laughs> well, on the, on, I mean, like, the, without getting too emo, because I'm sure there's time for that. Yeah. Um, although, actually, it is quite a nice bridge. Listen to the new stuff. I... 
it feels very it feels quite contemplative it feels like maybe maybe if i had one criticism of your work is that or it's maybe the perception of your work as opposed to actually the the what's really going on is that i think i maybe thought that bits of it were a bit clever clever uh -huh. and like certainly on this record it feels much more that i don't know almost like the songs come first if that makes yes. sense oh absolutely yeah that was a conscious decision and clever clever you again you make a very good point because clever clever was definitely something that we were all doing when i was in the band because Biffy, I think, were, they laid a real path of Clever Clever. And there were a lot of, and you know, Milo and Ocean Size. That was a scene. Clever Clever was a scene. And I think we could definitely have been guilty of clevering up our songs where it wasn't strictly necessary, definitely in Ruben. Right. And so, so since then, I've been trying, you know, more and more to get away from that. You know, and sometimes it's hard to just... I, I remember Biffy saying the same thing about puzzles. Sometimes it's harder to just lay on a groove and just do another chorus instead of some crazy coda. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. That's, that's what I was brought up on. So, yeah, it's been a conscious decision. Um, I think every album gets simpler and simpler. Um, I mean, I still like Clever Clever stuff. I still like Biffy, fuck's sake, all those bands. But uh, you th this album is very much a reaction against that. You're right. I mean, it's interesting, though, you know, when... You sort, you know, using this kind of catch-all term, clever, clever, is that, you know, that song "Lena, Don't Leave Me," which I presume is about your wife. Yes. Like, which is very, um, you know, the lyrics aren't. I mean, the lyrics, the lyrics are very plain and obvious, and therefore sincere. But it's like it's not like the chorus is like a dumb chorus. Like it's it's not like cheap trick or something. Like the, there are there, there's a clever lick going on there. No. I guess it, I guess it's just kind of like I had this idea of na, 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 like like kind of squonky rock, you know, which is oh, what dear. I what yeah. I <laughs> oh dear, <laughs> but that's what I kind of thought. But like it's just um, I'm not sure I was totally right about it because you've just named a bunch of bands there, you know, like say with Biffy. Like I came in, like I I I didn't really I, I wasn't really bothered until Puzzle, but at the same yeah. time, every, every time they put a record out now, whenever like whenever they're jutting against the obvious, I get really excited, you know? So I like everything. We're all in massive contradictions. Sure. But then, but then it's all in there. I mean, you say we're a massive contradictions. You're absolutely right. It's all in there at the same time. There's my love of simple songwriting, but then there's my love of clever, clever, and it's all true. None of it's like, Oh, I thought you were this. I thought you were that. If, if my career certainly as a solo artist has been anything, it's been about saying, look, I'm all these people. People are more complex than that, you know, and I'm saying that of my listeners as well as myself. People are able to process more than one thing from one artist. Some of them are. Some of the, you know, the reviews come back and the public reactions are like, this is crazy. And I think, is it that crazy yeah. that someone can listen to more than one type of music and make more than one type of music? That's my eternal crusade. I mean, it's interesting that, you know, like music critics constantly say things like, you know, where, like, where are the new Bowies? And you're like, well, maybe we should allow people to flex their creative muscles in all varieties of different directions. Of course, yeah. 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 And that's the dead end looking for the, you know, everyone's looking for the new Nirvana and all that rubbish. I remember there was a time period, wasn't there, about 20 years ago, where, where's the new Nirvana? And I'm like, oh, come on, guys, that's the wrong question. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, obviously, with the title, like, The Atheist, tell me a bit about that. Do you have a religious upbringing? No, not at all. And, uh, and that's the thing that I think a lot of people, it sounds like a reaction, doesn't it? A reaction against hardcore Catholicism, perhaps. Um, quite the reverse, quite the reverse. In fact, I sought religion on my own outside of my family framework in order to make sense of life. Just made it more complicated. My, my family was sort of a lapsed Church of England, you know. So even though we never went to church, um, my home life and my school life as well. We said prayers in assembly for fuck's sake. Jesus and God and the Bible were just, they were facts of life. You didn't question them. They weren't like slammed on you. But terms like sin were bandied about, you know, without question. And we were like, oh yeah, Jesus came back to life and he ate all the bread and there was fish left over. And we all just accepted it. And, uh, and then when I was a teenager and obviously your hormones are going, well, you don't understand anything. 
I started actively going to church on my own. I was actually looked at slightly askance by my family um, to try and answer some of those questions. And that's when I realized, oh, right, this doesn't make any sense. This, this makes it harder. Right, if anything, right. this makes it a lot harder. So that's when I sort of thought maybe I'm an atheist. And yeah, I am. You're definitely an atheist, not agnostic. Yeah, I, as far as I'm concerned, and I, I've just had loads of the albums back from the distributor, so it's too late to reprint the covers. Uh, yeah, yeah. Atheism is when you're pretty fucking certain there's nothing out there. Yeah. Agnosticism is like a hedging your bets. Maybe there is, maybe there isn't. But I'm pretty sure there is nothing. And that makes me happy, and it makes me feel free. I, I prefer that. Oh, wait, explain that to me. I mean, my one of my first... I mean, I mentioned my OCD before, and one of my... Probably my sort of like level pegging between uh, <laughs> between religion and um, and um, HIV were my first OCD obsessions. But I I was absolutely obsessed with uh, like a fear of nothing. That was like my first um, my first kind of bad time with OCD. And I'll be honest with you, I kind of arrived at the idea of being agnostic because it was that or like my brain break. It was like almost I had to accept that like this is just too much for me, yes. and but I I still find the idea of being like an accident or um, a one off or the only time this has ever happened really quite sad. But you're saying the opposite. Yes, it's it's the closest you can get to you know what um, Christians would call a miracle. You know the fact that we're alive for however long that's a miracle, it, and 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 it's not from anyone it's not a gift from anyone so you're not beholden to anyone apart from your parents i guess you know which is why you should treat them right for sure if anyone um i think your i point there about the fear of nothing is very you know it's uh, at the core of what we're talking about and when i sort of slowly put the pieces together logically and realized right well there is nothing i was afraid as well and it's that fear it's fear that what um religion is for isn't it um, but once you really think about there being nothing, actually that's, I just feel the opposite of fear. I just feel like an immense relief, just right. such a huge relief that there's no, you know, I don't want to start quoting the album, but there is a line that says, you know, you won't get judged and you won't get a prize, neither. Do you know what I mean? Stop stacking up this score of points that you think are going to get cashed in at some point. They're not. And there is a line, um, sorry, a quote from the film. I saw a film called Bad Boy Bobby, and there are quotes from that film throughout the record. The big line for me, at the point when I was trying to figure out church and whatnot, I saw this movie at like 4 a.m. on Channel 4, and there's a speech when an industrial capitalist speaks to the main character. He says, we don't live, but our atoms do move about in such a way that gives us, you know, consciousness and, and life. We don't, and therefore we don't die. Our atoms just move about differently. They separate, we become grass. And so if you think, oh shit, well, we're never really alive in the way that we think we are. So there's no loss when those atoms separate out. I think that's beautiful. And I think if we could teach our kids that, you know, hey, <laughs> your atoms are you now, later on your atoms will be something else. That would, I think that would take care of a lot of problems and people would walk around with a lot less fear and a lot less anxiety because as soon as I glommed onto that, so much pressure was lifted off me. And I'm, I'm, I'm saying it like an ecclesiastical service. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And no. I, did, I felt so much better when I realised that I wasn't beholden to anyone. There was nothing to fear. There was literally nothing to fear. Nothing. There's nothing. All right, well, I, I guess my sort of how i would counteract that because that idea of uh i think that's a really beautiful statement that idea of all right it's just they move about they move on they move something else i guess it's almost kind of like you know i'm probably not going to say it as poetically but that idea of sort of we're all stardust right you know like yeah. we're we're all we're all dinosaur bones we're all volcanoes we're, I, yeah. I, I, I love all that right like yeah. i'm not i think that my thirst for religion was never about um, almost like a kind of like a rule book for living. Well, it that was, too. It, I was. It was never so much, so much that because I was a, you know, I, I had some stuff with my sexuality when I was younger, and I always kind of knew that what was, 
uh, what was being told of me, you know, was uh, was was just wrong. You know, like I knew I wasn't wrong for feeling how I felt, for example. But how does how does like I guess there's a little segue here to this song, "Bad Friend," which I I think is amazing in just how kind of honest it is or unflinchingly honest it is. Like, how does morality fit in with all of that? Like, how do, how does knowing we're doing the the right thing? You Well, you just got to know. It's all about personal autonomy, isn't it? You know, a lot of people will sort of blithely say, you know, as long as you're not hurting anybody, that's fine. And I broadly go along with that. That, that fits most of the holes, doesn't it? Obviously, there's wiggle room. You just got to work it out for yourself. But again, that's why it's hard, isn't it? Because if you've got this big fucking pamphlet that says, do, don't, do, don't, do, don't, you know, hang men who lie with other men and throw them into the river, excuse me, I've got a question, um, then, then that's fine. That absolves you of all things. You don't even have to fucking think, do you? And this great catchphrase of, well, where's the proof? Faith. <laughs> yeah. You've got faith instead of proof. So having to write your own rule book is harder, and that's why people don't want to fucking do it. But um, I'm sorry, that's the job, to be a functioning human, I think you've got to write your own rubric, and it's pretty fucking clear. And um, less atheism, but more the, the um, current culture, should we say, of um, accountability. Well, it's weird because it, uh, on social media and things like I, I got your receipts, you know, we're very into accountability and people's um, mistakes, you know, have been brought up. I don't know whether there's a time limit on these things, and that's a hard and old discussion. But people are being brought to account. Some people, other people, politicians. I think Trump um, waved in an era of zero accountability. The fact that the most powerful person in the world can be confronted with tape and video evidence of himself saying and doing a thing, and just say, "No, I didn't do that." And for it to just go away, yeah, that yeah, was yeah. really, you know, I don't know uh, if that was the end of history or whatever. I found that fucking terrifying. Yeah, and yeah. that is why Bojo thought he could just have photos of him at a party and say, no, I didn't do that. But fortunately, we hated him a bit more than the Americans hated Trump, so we healed him out. But Trump's era of non-accountability almost allowed him to get away with that. I think what I'm saying is, about this accountability, that's where bad friend comes in. Because we're now inviting people to say, look at yourself, look at your past mistakes. What ramifications do they have? Does it need addressing? It certainly needs owning. And that's what bad friend is about, certainly. Yeah. It's it's interesting that though. I mean I'm I'm fairly fascinated with this culture of accountability or like shaming. I mean I did a whole it's on this feed, I did a whole um a whole podcast series about the idea of shame and yeah. spoke to a bunch of people who'd quote unquote been cancelled and so on. And it, it was really interesting to kind of get into the duplicity of a lot of the process that comes with that. I mean, I know myself, like I've been flamed for various things on, on social media and stuff. And it's like psychologically been one of the worst things that ever happened to me. Yeah. And it didn't really make me kind of think it never made me think, Oh, okay, well that's made me a, become more accountable for my failings or things that are perceived as failings it just fucked me up and it also made me feel like you know you don't know the you don't know how far i've walked in my shoes like you don't know the things that have led me to the place i am i have a bit of a thing like you know i'm fully aware that say for example some people think that i'm over opinionated or i'm loud or, or i could list all manner of things but i also know why i'm like that and I know that I'm working on that. And I guess that what was interesting about that song, Bad Friend, is it was like, I didn't quite think that it was about this idea of accountability culture. I think it was more that you were just being brave enough to admit your own failings. Isn't that the same thing? I don't think so, no. Okay, well, then maybe I've um, it split that off unintentionally on a rant about a Trumpism, and for which I apologise. Well, no, I mean, you never, I mean, it's it's in the, it's in the air, isn't it? <laughs> like, you know he's 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 back on the b the bird up. Oh fuck's sake! Um, let's <laughs> let's not think about that. I yeah, it was well again. I've been on a on, on another crusade. You know, if you look at things like um, King of Clubs, I, I looked at it a lot in King of Clubs, my previous record, where I, I I examined negative aspects of my own personality and brought them to the fore. You know, in, in order to just have it out in the open and expose it. 
and and even back as things like um as far as things like muscle memory there was the song all the things you hate about me i hate them too i'm i'm fucking aware i'm a, I'm a, a self-aware entity you know and all the faults i got them you know there's no need to fucking tell me what's wrong with me I'm, i already know and i'm working i'm working that's crucial I'm working to get better and expunging them and exposing them and owning them is part of that process. And it can be a painful process. All right, get this though, right? So again, my OCD group, I go to a support group and you'll be sat in a room and there'll be a bunch of people there and they, I mean, they'll be almost in tears about like these thoughts that they're having, right? Like yeah. these, uh, they're called ego dystonic. So it's the idea of the thoughts that distress us are things that target our pardon me they target our um our values or our belief systems so say there'll be someone in there there'll be like a young girl and she'll be obsessed that she's gonna like hurt her baby yes and she's almost like the last person in the world that would hurt her baby but that's why she's distressed about it yeah and after a period of time going there i would come out of the room and be like you know i work in the music industry i've met some horrendous people right yeah. like i know that those people don't go to a support group and talk about their failings. And it almost was kind of like heartbreaking to me to think all these people come to a room every week, talk about all of these like perceived terrors that are in their mind, but yet that's they're good people and that's why this illness has targeted them. Yes. Do you not feel a little bit like being super self aware and trying to understand ourselves almost leaves us slightly at a disadvantage for the proper terrors in the world? Well, it just means that you've got a bigger workload, isn't it? It just means you've you've got more to do. There's more on your plate. Yeah, I mean, I see I see what you're saying there, and it is those people that walk around believing that they're perfect are frightening because you know they've got there's there's work to do within and there's work to do without, and I'm it's a full time job. It's a full time job. I guess it's almost like you know you mentioned Trump and and, and Boris. You know, they're they're two people I, I don't imagine have a great amount of introspection. Sure, I mean that's their their narcissists, aren't they? And I. I've only really um, learned really what narcissism means. Everyone thinks narcissism from narcissists, you know, someone who's vain, but that's not really, that's only the, the part of it. And, and that's what we're talking about on Bad Friend with the character speaking in Bad Friend, who has been me, who has been people that I've uh, had to deal with, is a, is a narcissist. That It's about narcissism, that behavior. So we've got to look out for that. And you've got to, you've got to guard yourself and you've got to guard people from yourself. Right, right. Let's, I, I'm going to kind of move on from uh, such kind of heaviness. It's a baptism of fire, Jimmy. <laughs> no, it's, 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 no, it's, probably, it's funny when you mentioned, um, as soon as we kind of got to religion, I was like, there's been quite a lot of religion on this podcast recently. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, no, thanks for that. With, um, with your stuff, I guess the other thing, going back to how I used to perceive you, and I think I was incorrect, do you feel like... You only have to spend like five minutes on like your website or your merch store or whatever just to see how relentlessly creative you are. Do you feel like? Do you feel like that should have been recognised more than it has been? I mean, you know, you you often get the kind of cult hero thing. Do, you know, I imagine that being a cult hero doesn't. It isn't the best way of paying the mortgage, right? Like, <laughs> do you feel like you you deserved more than what you've been what you've what you've got? No, not at all. Not at all. I, I I used to. I was very frustrated the way that um, people pigeonholed the band. I I thought the band, although this isn't um, to echo what a lot of our supporters say that you know Ruben should have been massive. They should have been playing stadiums. No, we fucking shouldn't. You know, have you heard what we, we were playing? Aggressive, regular, <laughs> yeah. post hardcore. Do you know what I mean? It was what it was. And if you want to go and play stadiums, you do what Biffy did. You make a concerted decision to emphasize certain areas and they haven't at all wrinkled out their sound they're still weird as fuck yeah it took a long time with a team of people to work out how to translate that we weren't gonna ever gonna do that fine that's fine with myself um i think i'm about where i you know i'm in the right pocket it did seem that as soon as i came back as a solo artist people said okay here's a creative force to be reckoned with and i was allowed I was afforded some level of stature as well, which was nice. I didn't just start from the beginning again, as I thought I would. People recognized my history and said, OK, here's a guy who's got standing. He's He's got it in the bank. And, and they were sort of ready for what I had um, going forward. The only thing that does frustrate me is when people say things like, 
crazy wild man, Jamie Lemon, or like <laughs> lunatic maniac. And I'm like, really? Right, right. Really? Is this so mad what I'm doing? Every two years, he writes a different song to the last one. And I'm like, yeah, huh? <laughs> you know, just because I don't shit out like an identical record every two years, yeah. some people, it blows their minds. And I think you have got to be smarter than that. So that's the only bit I get frustrated by. But otherwise, you know, I'm very happy with, I'm happy with being a cult hero. All my favorite things are cult things anyway. I mean, cult is just a byword for like, a small amount of people really like it as opposed to a large amount of people like it a bit. And I know which one I prefer. Yeah. So it's yeah. fine. It's fine with me. Yeah. I mean, I always think cults sound like a right laugh until the Kool-Aid bit. You know? <laughs> yeah. No, I'd, I'd never quite go there. Yeah. But um, yeah, cult's fine. That's fine. I, I think it's a thing as well. I was thinking about this. I was, I was literally thinking about it today. I was thinking, I think that when I started off writing, about music and therefore championing music, the, the, the sort of the narrative was almost like they should be the biggest band in the world. And then I always kind of go like, I think na these days I just think, well, like nothing, like with the exception of the Beatles <laughs> and like chips or something, like nothing brilliant is like the biggest thing in the world, you know? Like, Very difficult to do, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So it's almost that thing of like, no, prob you know, you shouldn't be the, the, the biggest acts in the world, but. I just wonder if there's an there's another tier where you're like. I mean, do you feel like kind of making the art that you make, you can uh, you can make your career what you want it to be? Yes, I think so. I you know I'm very fortunate to be in a position where you know if I make a record, I have a label that will pay for it for a start which is a novelty it shouldn't be but it but it is you know we were paying for our own records in in Reuben. And even at one point, you know, we were the record label. No one else had put it out. We pressed it, you know, we distributed it. So that's very fortunate to have that safety net. And I'm also, I've also got enough of a platform um, that people will buy it. You know, if I put out a record, X amount of people will buy it, which will more than, you know, pay for whatever costs there were. And people will play it as well. You know, Danny at Radio 1 and various supporters, you know, John Kennedy at XFM, Radio X, sorry. Has always been very good to me and, and and other people along the way so that's an incredibly fortunate position to be in um especially the older you get because you know rock and roll is kinder to veterans than pop perhaps yeah but i still have to pinch myself that people take me seriously as an older performer i'm i turned 40 last week you know i still get booked for the, the same festivals, the same shows as other, you know, acts that are straight out the gate. And I don't take that for granted at all. The only thing I do want is a, is a wider audience. That would, is what I would like. But that's, I, think, I think that's what I was getting at. Yeah, but that's a constant, a constant craving. Thank you, baby. <laughs> um, you always want to reach more people. You always want a wider audience. And that's part of that was thinking, you know, The Atheist, this record, it's more accessible, it's it's um, more streamlined, and I didn't write it to reach a broader audience, but when I had it together, I did think, oh, maybe this will widen the audience a bit, and that remains to be seen. But um, that's all I want, it's just a few more people in the door, a few more record sales every time, and I'm quite happy with that rate of uh, increase, you know? So I'm going to have constant craving in my head for the rest of the day now. You're welcome. You're welcome. Well, I was actually playing it the other day. Me and my wife were discussing. I mean, when I say discussing, I mean like more that I was sharing a crackpot theory and she was just nodding. Yeah. But we, we were actually listening to constant craving the other day and we were thinking, I was thinking like for my generation, we, and we're similar, I'm 42. Yeah. Like she, she had the honour or the duty of introducing lesbians <laughs> to an entire generation. Yeah. Like, I had no, you know, like, sit down, Ellen. Like, before that, Katie Lang. I mean, I, just, I, I literally didn't know that women and women could love each other. I think that's an, I think that's an amazing legacy to have. Oh, it's incredible. And, I, you know, I'm sure it's not something she asked for. No, but, exactly. Uh, yeah, but you're, you're right, yeah. And uh, me too. I was like, she does what? Oh. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> no, exactly. I just, think, what, I just think that's amazing. What a tune, though. Yeah, try, and, try and squeeze that on a B-side at some point. Okay, yeah, deal. Oh, I like, I like it. I like it when you can trace ideas to the germ of them. I'm Do gonna shuffle yeah. too. Here we go. My record label like cowering. I've I've read in the past. You know, people like a lot of music writers talk about being frustrated musicians. Like I'm a frustrated illustrator, if I'm being honest. And okay. your stuff, your stuff's amazing. 
like how but i've also read you talk about before how really music was almost like sort of the sideline and it doesn't really feel like that anymore like when did that change well that that's very much how i felt after my band um exploded because you know um i was drawing pictures before i was playing guitar so I, i always felt like i was a cartoonist first and even through the band i was still working for rock sounds and doctor who magazine as an as an illustrator as a cartoonist um and then when my band sort of uh, imploded i guess i was left all i was left with was illustration and i was working at a design agency at the time in london and i had about a year when i didn't i didn't even pick up my guitar and and i looked at myself and i thought oh well i guess well this isn't really that weird because this is what i was doing before music and this is what i'm doing now and i couldn't see a future for music so i just thought well i guess this is who i am now and so i came to view my time in the band as a slight aberration like a weird little experiment slash holiday like oh i did that for a bit but now okay let's get back to business and then you know as time went on i sort of fell into a solo career without really planning it um and then i began to consider that oh, okay well maybe there is maybe there's a situation where they can live side by side which is which is where i am now right, like, right. i spend half my time well it goes up and down for the last couple of years actually i've been doing more music than illustration but the illustration is always bubbling away and then there were periods where i do not much music and illustration was my main focus i did a lot of children's books at one point so they sort of exist in a in a nice uh, seesaw kind of harmony uh, and now i'm both yeah but i did feel at one point that perhaps music was just a you know a fun thing that i tried and had now stopped with creativity do you ever find that there are do you ever find that you have an, like a, an excess of ideas do you ever find you don't have home you, don't, you can't find home homes for all of your ideas yeah god i wish you know i wish i had um more me i wish there was an army of clones that could do all the stuff that i want to do i've been i've been very lucky to have had essentially two careers as it is you know as a, as a an artist a traditional artist, illustrator, designer, and as a musician. And I've also, recently, I've been doing a lot of journalism as well. So we're heading into sort of three careers now. And I just don't have time for all the other stuff. I mean, there's, I don't want to- What have you been writing? Well, I write, I mean, I say journalist. Uh, I've been writing a lot of um, Doctor Who magazine. And, and, and it um, may not surprise you to know that Doctor Who magazine is actually an umbrella of titles. There's four or five. Yeah, um, yeah churning titles um, from Panini and uh, so I do the reviews every month for Doctor Who Mag but I also do um, lots of articles about Doctor Who fandom in general so I have to interview a lot of people but then I might be called on to write an overview of the last you know year of the show for a different magazine so I'm always writing um, it, it takes time you know and to deal with people as well is very difficult to deal with the public um and uh make sure that they're all happy and whatnot because a lot of pressure something like doctor who people care about it so much and they get quite uptight sometimes and you want to make sure that that's a nice experience for them to be involved with something as totemic as doctor who magazine yeah what are you what are you saying to where doctor who finds itself right now uh to be frank i'm a little bit frightened by its association with disney because okay. of their um LGBTQIA plus track records, right? Which is less than great, and for such a um, a gay program, Doctor Who is gay as balls, right? Yeah. So to be taking money from that institution raises a lot of questions for me. I sort of I sort of inherently trust Russell T Davies because he's very good. He's good people, you know, and he's done a lot of good work. Um, and so you have to. You know, if anyone else was taking that um, Mickey money, I would be. Ve- if Stephen Moffat was taking the Mickey money, I'd be. I'd run for the hills. Right, right, right. But I have faith in, let's say, our captain Russell T Davies. But it's not without trepidation. In, in in terms of content, though, well, not. I suppose that is that is content. In terms of actually, kind of the direction that it's taken. I mean, I I actually found myself for the first time since the reboot, kind of falling away at the end of oh, like... yeah it was it's been um you know it, it goes in chops and peaks yeah i, I have a professional <laughs> association <laughs> with doctor who so i i can't 
really say what I what I think about the most the last few years. I think everyone there's troughs and peaks. Can we say that? And that I'm very excited. I, on the other hand, I'm very excited about Ru what Russell will bring to it. I think it's about to get really good again. There, there's certainly the chance. Should we say that it's it? We could be on the stepping stone of a new year. And and the fact the fact that it's got Disney level money. That really is quite amazing because it was always made for nothing when it was made by the BBC back in the 20th century. The BBC hated it. Not only were they giving it no money, they were actively trying to kill it. Then when it came back in the 21st century, it was like, this is our prime show. We love this. We're going to get right behind it. We're going to give it loads of money. And it, But it still wasn't quite enough to yeah, make it yeah. very good. Now it's a fucking Disney property. It has Disney money. So it, there will be no holds barred, and that is uh, uh, um, really thrilling. Yeah, that the writers can do whatever they want, provided there's not two people of the same sex kissing. Who knows? I always thought, I always thought it was, it was. I mean, I, I, I can't see like RTD sticking around for very long if that's not the case, though. Do you know what I mean? Like, I feel like I always like feel like I've, I like sci-fi a lot, but I'm not really like a hard sci-fi guy, you know. So his take on Doctor Who from the off. I loved because it was so human. Like, yeah. you know, like his doctor was literally like, oh, you know, what Like, what if we saw the best in people? Like, I always thought that was amazing. And I just feel like, I don't know, I'm just quite excited about it. I've I, I just realised I, I, I stayed up to, not stayed up, but I stayed on Children of Need to find out who the assistant was. And I was like, God, oh. what, who are you, James? Are you 21 again? You know, it was, like, it was, it was, it was nice, you know, to, to feel excited about something I love so much. Mm, it's it's definitely exciting. Whenever there's a change of producer, it's very exciting. You know, a roll of the dice, what's going to happen? And especially with RTD, he's got past form. And David Tennant, I think that's a very clever, funny, lovely thing to do for the anniversary, to bring back a beloved Doctor. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. I'm, all, I'm, all, I'm up for some more Donna as well. Yes. Um, I, I've got to ask about... Can I ask a question about Ruben? Oh, as many as you like. Ruben, people don't understand... Ruben is not only my uh, specialist subject, it's also my favourite band, so please. Yeah, I mean, I can tell. I mean, I was asking more to be, like, polite as opposed to, like, I don't think I'm going to be allowed to ask some, something yeah, about Ruben. Fine. But, um, well, you know, you always say you get back together. Do you think you'll get back together? What, what, oh. We're always saying we're going to get back together. You you always said like it was always but it was always pitched as a as a hiatus as opposed to as, as a split. Yeah, that sort of thinking you know next year's next year's twenty years since the first record. Nah, no chance, no chance. The, I mean, the trouble is, the trouble is that hiatus, which was. That can was I just can I just can I just say the other day I interviewed Graham Coxon from Blur and said, "Do you think Blur will get back together?" And he was like, <laughs> "No, no chance." And then the following week. <laughs> They, they announced two Wembley shows. So. I think the office Graham Cox and get might be a little bit tasted. In the <laughs> but um, no, I mean, I've started saying no chance because every time someone asked me and I'd said, well, I guess there's like 1% chance if we, you know, for all, they give us £7 million or whatever, or, or we're put into some life-threatening situation. And then people will go rabid and the internet it would explode. So I've now just started saying, no, no, because I don't want to. Um, and I can't see a situation wherein we ever would. There, you know, I mean, we would, we would do it for a life-changing amount of money. Of course, we would. We're not fucking stupid. Yeah. But, but Ruben aren't worth. Bless you, Ruben aren't worth a life-changing amount of money. And every year we get the offers, and it's you know about what you would pay, you know, a legacy band to headline whatever festival. But I'd still have to, you know go to work the next day or you know work you know if i could go and live on a yacht in the bahamas then sure yeah one gig whatever but it's it's not realistic um i just don't want to that's the thing that no one can quite understand and then they say but it would make loads of people happy and i'm like uh-huh <laughs> sure no, no i can absolutely understand why you, why you wouldn't want to do it you know it's it's one of those things i'm trying to think who uh it's one of those things is like a journalist you just you go I I have to ask this question, but yeah. I also I also, you know, as a fan of like early nineties alt rock, and growing up, being into bands that didn't exist anymore, and having seen all of those bands after they've reformed, yeah, I can say that I enjoyed about ten minutes of Pavement and <laughs> and a couple of Pixie shows. Like yeah. the re the rest of it's been quite you know like I. D 
it, it's felt a bit gross. It's felt like it shouldn't really be in the era it's in. So I, I totally understand. Yeah. I, I think it's more. Are you are you still friendly with everyone? Oh, a hundred percent. Both both the members of Ruben called me on my birthday, right, to tell me happy birthday, and they were all there at my party. Apart from John, who'd got called into work, but he was at my uh, wedding anniversary, and I'm sure we'll see each other during the festive period. Yes, we are friends, and um, and it's been, but I won't um, uh, dissemble and say that that hasn't been a process. You know, when the band split up, we probably weren't friends. Right. And it's been a, a lot of work to reclaim those people back into my life who I, I cared about an awful lot. And a lot of the point of, of ending the band, stopping the band, was so there could be a future for us as, as people. Because if it had gone on any further, we would have destroyed each other. So the fact that I still talk to them, you know, fairly regularly and at important occasions like birthdays and whatnot, it means the world to me. And I would trade the band for that any day of the week. So it's the people that matter to me. Absolutely. I feel like that's a good place to leave things, Jamie. But um, thanks so much for your, thanks so much for your time. Like. <laughs>